Welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be reacting to one of the videos from the YouTube channel The Game Theorists. I'm a huge fan of their work, I hope that you will like this video as well. This video came out in year 2019, so at least around 2 years ago. And let's start. A riddle. There are two pictures of a door. In the first picture, the door is closed. In the second picture, taken later, the door is open. Nobody opened the door. The door didn't open itself. The door, in fact, did not open at all. So what happened? Pause the video, debate it in the comments. Because the solution to that riddle is what today's episode and the entire Petscop mystery is all about. The door have always been opened. It's just that we see closed, isn't it? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory! Hello! Hello to Game Theory, hello. Where it's been a long time since we've talked about some dead children. Which, let's face it, is the lifeblood of this channel. So let's fix that, shall we? <laughs> Today we're hopping back into the ongoing investigation of Petscop, Pet history's Scott. least played horror game. Now, if you haven't watched any of the channel's previous videos on the topic, or you've just forgotten during the last eight months since we covered this issue, I'm gonna give you a brief recap on what you need to know to understand today's episode. At its core, Petscop is a twisted tale of abuse and Probably murder, a fictional let's play that houses a larger mystery, all unfolding here on YouTube via a series of currently 16 videos. We no. It's always sad to listen to this. We get most of our information through Paul, the person we most often watch playing the game. After finding the game in his house, Paul began recording himself experimenting with it, and in 2017 began uploading the videos onto what he calls the Family YouTube Channel. Early in his gameplay, he inputs a code that unlocks a darker, twisted layer hiding in the bowels of this otherwise generic PlayStation era game. Paul almost immediately finds a gravestone for a dead child, Michael Hammond, and it becomes apparent that something, or someone, is trying to communicate with him. It's just a very sad. Gosh. As I went over in my previous theories, I believe that that person is the game's creator, Rainer, who originally made the game as a means of accusing someone named Marvin of horrific crimes against children, potentially even trapping him in the game. Mix in a bunch of censored imagery, talk of rebirthing, and the game's sparse atmosphere, and you have yourself a masterpiece of slow burn psychological horror. Now, Petscop is an enormous puzzle, with layers upon layers of mystery, telling a much more complex narrative than pretty much anything that this channel has ever covered save for, like, Dark Souls. This is far, far more complex storytelling than FNAF. As such, it would take a massive theory to do everything in this series justice. There are just too many unanswered questions that need to be solved. And I'll be honest, I don't have all those answers. At least, not yet. However, I do feel like I have some answers. Some really important answers to some of the biggest questions in the game. So today, I'm gonna attempt to answer two major pieces of the puzzle, which together will outline the very essence of how I think this universe is operating and lead us to potentially the biggest reveals yet. First, what is the purpose of Stravinsky's septet? And second, what oh. happened to the windmill? Which is perhaps the single biggest question that's been looming over the series since the second upload. Oh no. What is... Where is the windmill? First, the piano. Petscop is a game that gives us nothing. Actually, let me rephrase that. It gives us a lot, but rarely is any of it explicitly told to us. Instead, it's all hidden under allusions to eyebrows and windmills and rebirthing. Want to know who's related to who? Check the eyebrows. Want to know what year we're in? Check the calendars. Want to know who's playing the game at any given moment in time? Great! So do I, because it is harder to figure out than you would think. But one piece of information it does explicitly give us is the name Stravinsky's September. A re Stravinsky Septet. Stravinsky Septet. Oh, I, oh my god, I'm pronouncing wrongly. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. 
real piece of music from a real composer out oh. here in the real world. It's first mentioned by name during Petscop 12. Quote, I'm calling you Belle because that's who you are. You might be confused as to what happened. I was over eager before and started calling you Tiara prematurely. I created a space in the menu for you, still unused now. Then I put you inside the machine and played the second movement of Stravinsky's septet on the needles. I played it wrong, but that would have been okay. If you hadn't given up halfway, you would be Tiara. This is not what happened. And now I'm gone. There it is, mentioned explicitly by name, which means that there's gotta be something unique about this particular piece of music that the creator of Petscop really wants us to know about. That's not all. Sure, Stravinsky's septet is first mentioned in Petscop 12, but listen closely throughout the series and you'll see that the notes of the septet have actually been a recurring musical motif throughout the entirety of the series. A sped up version first made its debut during episode seven. Wait, what? As the unusual noises that play in the quitter's room. Oh my gosh! And again in Petscop 11 during this incredibly prolonged music lesson. So what's so special about this particular piece of music? I mean, in all the world of classical music, this is a really obscure piece for the creators of Petscop to choose for their story. And then to not just call out Stravinsky's septet, but specifically the second movement of it? There hmm, that's true. The specific second movement of that particular classical. That's very... There's gotta be something to this thing. So yeah, this gotta be something. Why started researching? First, it's important to note that Stravinsky's septet is divided into three separate movements. This, to me, is an important detail since the Petscop story is divided into three very distinct time periods. 1977, where it all begins, when Marvin causes his friend, who I've guessed in the past is named Tiara, to disappear, along with a windmill. It was a busy year for the guy. Second is the mid-90s, when the actual game of Petscop is created by Rainer and given to Marvin, and when kids like Michael and Care start disappearing and reappearing. And last, 2017, when our protagonist Paul finds Petscop, starts recording his Let's Play and the haunted behavior happening inside the game, and then begins uploading those videos onto YouTube. It's a story told in three major acts, just like the three movements of the septet. We're also expressly told that the main house we visit, Rainer's house, is frozen, captured at three different points in time. Three oh. movements yet again. Now, consider the fact that it's a septet. By its name, a musical piece for seven people to play. True. Septet. Seven. Do you know what I said? September? Seven. Wait, why is September? Wait, no, no, think about it. Why is September named September? When the seventh month is July. Hmm. I shouldn't say that, right? Anyways, let's continue. What do we have in Petscop but seven named characters? Marvin the murderer, Rainer his accuser, Tiara, Belle, and Michael, his possible victims, Care, his daughter, and Paul, our protagonist. Seven key players in our story, a septet. But then why the second movement in particular? And what's all this about playing it badly and not becoming Tiara? Well, there's actually a lot here. It seems like playing the septet is directly tied to what Petscop refers to as the rebirthing process, where, through playing the song, Belle would have been reborn as Tiara. What exactly I think that might mean, I'll get to in a minute, but for now, just consider it a transition. An ep Wait, rebirthing process, a transition. Right. Now, what is going on? Evolution from one form to another, and this is reflected in the choice of the second movement. According to Erwin Stein's analysis of the Stravinsky Septet, the three movements were representative of Stravinsky's rebirthing as a musician. The first movement is closely tied with his early compositional style, and movement three reflects his later, more modern style, with the second movement serving as the transition between the two. It's the means by which Stravinsky transforms himself as an artist. In much the same way, characters and Petscop are playing the song to rebirth into some other form. It's also worth noting that the second movement is what's known as a Pasigalia, a slow instrumental piece can- Pasigalia. Hmm, the more you know. The least we can learn uh, about musical education. Yay! Awesome. 
consisting of variations on a theme played over a repeated bass part. Mm. Repeated variations, just like the story of Petska, where time and actions overlap and sync up with each other, where history is constantly repeating itself just with slight variations every time. Care being a repeated version of the Windmill Girl, Paul being a repeat of Care. I do agree there's a resemblance very strong resemblance between us. The game being passed from Raynor to Marvin to Paul. Even Care, the game's overworld being repeated in some twisted version of what fans of the game call Odd Care. It's all okay. cyclical. It's all the same theme repeating with slight variations every time. But lastly, and most importantly, wonder why this sounds so random and gross and not like something someone would actually want to compose? Well, that's because it's a variant of what's known as 12-tone serialism, where- Oh, so it's 12-tone serialism. To put it simply, all the notes are treated equally. As such, the music never feels like it truly lands in any one solid key signature like 99% of the songs that you listen to. It instead gives it the sound of a bunch of random notes instead of, you know, an actual song that people would want to listen to. Here's why this is so important. According to experts on the Let's Talk Music subreddit when discussing 12-tone compositions, the 12-tone technique is controversial and is criticized as being robotic or reducing music to algorithms, becoming the equivalent of soulless noise. And here is where we unwrap the true meaning of rebirthing. I've mentioned in a previous theory how it feels like Marvin is trapped in the game, and it's something that Paul senses as he plays. This game is trying very hard to make it seem like, like there's an entity in it, like a, a ghost or an AI trying to communicate with me. Trying to communicate with the player. But it's the choice of the septet that confirms that this is actually what's happening, and that playing the song is the method by which it happens. I mean, think about it. We have seen hidden images in the game that show real-world pianos with controllers attached to them. In Pets Cop 16, we see the floor layout of a room where the piano itself is being kept. A room that feels an awful lot like a prison, or scientific testing room in the way that it's being monitored. And we're being reborn by playing a song that we just learned outright serves as a bridge between art and algorithms. The rebirthing process then seems to be entering the Petscop game by playing the song, converting a real person into a computer program, trapping them there until eventually they're able to be spat back out, perhaps by playing the song again as someone or something new. Now let's talk about this. Oh my god. What? What? Second big mystery of the game, the windmill. Rainer poses this question to Marvin in Petscop 9. You must have guessed, but I was looking through your things. I found that picture of you from 1977, standing in front of an old windmill with your friend. You went there, and it was a bad idea. Your friend and the windmill both disappeared into thin air. Her sister was holding the camera. She took another picture minutes later, just you, no windmill, and no friend. Your friend never returned with you, and the windmill was gone. I went to see it myself. Where is it? What did you do? The windmill is one of the key icons from this series, appearing and disappearing seemingly at random, showing up in photographs, letters, most recently making yet another crucial appearance as a miniature at the start of Petscop 14. It appears to be the location of Marvin's first crime, the place where his friend was lost forever. Clearly, Petscop's creator intends for us to figure out the mystery of the vanishing windmill. Oh, the vanishing windmill. Mm. Tell me more. And up until this point, it has remained completely unsolved. But I think, with release of episodes 14 and 15, we may finally have enough information to put the pieces together. We're first introduced to the windmill in episode 2, but it's in Petscop 4 when the windmill actually disappears. However, even though it's no longer there, something still exists in its place. It looks sort of like a placeholder for it. Of course, we know from Petscop 9 that the missing windmill texture isn't missing at all. Way back in Petscop 1, Paul reads us a note. I walked downstairs, and when I got to the bottom, instead of proceeding, I turned to the right and became a shadow monster man. 
It's not until Pet Scop 9 that Paul discovers what exactly that means. And what it means is pretty literal. You go downstairs, you take a right, and you become a shadow. Once he becomes the, the shadow, the shadow, shadow the monster man, Paul heads to the windmill where, lo and behold, the placeholder has now been replaced with the fully fledged windmill object. So why would becoming a shadow monster suddenly change the way the rest of the world appears to us? The answer to that question, I believe, is going to help us explain a ton of the weirdness throughout the series. So maybe what he meant is that the windmill exists in Shadow World and not the real world. I believe that by becoming a shadow, Paul has changed what dimension he's seeing in the game. Paul's avatar has basically been rotated along an axis that we can't see so that his shadow replaces his avatar. Oh, it's something like a parallel world in a game. And now, in the process, he's able to see things in a different dimension that persists. It just persists at a different rotation that's usually invisible to us when we're playing the main game. Now, this idea of dimensional rotation may seem like it's coming out of nowhere, but let's take a minute to look at episode 14. It starts with the riddle I asked you at the beginning of this episode, a door that's simultaneously open and closed. The episode then spends the rest of its runtime focused on the way things are rotated. Midway through, there's an extension extended sequence where Paul plays around with a series of CDs and picture frames all rotated at slightly different angles around a vertical axis. The kind of thing that the player normally can't do in Petscop. Later in the same episode when we see the game reload, the game maker's logo, Garolina, now ends up at a radically different angle than it did in the beginning of Petscop 1. The differently rotated logo reveals to Paul a game with totally different save files. The last we saw of this screen was in Petscop 10. Paul's files were named Paul, test, and backup. Strange Situation is an entirely new save file. Based on this hypothesis, the original files aren't gone, and the game didn't delete anything. It was an issue of Paul booting up the game unintentionally in a different state, at a different rotation. And finally, if all of this wasn't enough, at the end of the episode, Paul gains access to the house's mysterious garage, a door that was once closed and now, for some unexplained reason, open. How the door open? It's the answer to the riddle. Two dimensions at two different rotations. Pictures taken at different angles. Inside the garage, we find a computer. The computer Rainer presumably used to program the game Petscop. On his computer's tower is this strange symbol. Is it a company logo? A hidden glyph or symbol? No, it's a three-dimensional axis. X, Y, Z, which means that once Paul masters the ability to rotate, all the secrets of the game suddenly become unlocked. All past save files, hidden locations like the windmill, past time periods, all trapped in different orientations of the same game. So do these revelations solve the mystery of the game? No. Not by a long shot. I'm not pretending that they do, but I do feel like we are significantly closer now. Yes, we are taking one step at a time to learn about what the game truly means. You know, baby step, baby step, you know, just baby steps. Tick, tick, tick. Two key questions that are much closer to being solved. The true nature of the rebirthing process and the lost location of the windmill. Petscop 16 currently seems like it may be the final installment. It certainly has an air of finality to it. But at this point, only time will tell. But hey, it's worth remembering as we close out this episode that Petscop is a real game. The people huh? behind the series are literally making a video game just so they can film a fictional Let's Play of it to tell their bizarre creepypasta. It's actually one of the reasons I love the Petscop series so much. It is perhaps one of the most modern examples of storytelling out there. And guess what? If you too have a story that you want to tell, you can do it too. With the help of our sponsor for today's episode, Skillshare. You've heard us mention Skillshare before. They've been a fantastic partner to all us theorists. It's an online learning community specifically oriented for creators, with more than 25,000 classes available taught by experts in their respective fields. For instance, how to punch things really hard. Like, punch! <laughs> oh my gosh, I love being on punch man. 
methods. I just mentioned game design. Well, mm. if you wanted to create a pet scop of your own, they have everything that you need to get started. Okay. When I was in college, that was pretty much the only place where I could find really good programming courses. But today, classes on stuff like Java that I took in college are now on Skillshare for you to do any time. No waking up for an 8.30 a.m. class required. Whenever you feel like sitting down in front of your screen in your pajama pants to learn yourself some game maker, you can do it. It's learning on demand. But Java and Game Maker are just the tip of the iceberg. They have courses on the Unity game engine, courses on creating pixel art, even tutorials on writing for video games. If you've wanted to check out game design but have no idea where to start, then this is a great place to do it with no pressure, no one looking over your shoulder, and total freedom to control your experience. Oh yeah, and it's also significantly cheaper than college and other online learning <laughs> programs. So go ahead, try it out, see if game design is as fun as you think it is, or just learn about it to be able to express yourself in a whole new medium. Skillshare can help you do it literally this weekend, or screw this weekend, literally as soon as you finish watching this video. And with a premium membership, it gives you unlimited access to every every single one of those 25,000 courses. And an annual subscription is less than $10 a month. I told you this thing was significantly cheaper and more practical than college. And best of all, the first thousand of my subscribers to use the link in the description will get a two-month free trial. So scurry your little theorist butts over there and start programming your dream game today. I am eagerly awaiting doing a theory on what you produce. Your mysteries are as good as mine. Uh huh? Called pets instead of pet scots. <laughs> now that would be interesting to know. Thanks so much for watching this video. This video came out from the YouTube channel The Game Theorists. I'm a huge fan of their work. I hope that you will like this video as well. Do do check out more of their works and their videos are awesome. Thank you. If you do like my videos, please consider to like, share, and subscribe to my channel, and comment down below if you have anything to share with us. And yeah, just follow my channel. Thank you. So it's like, share, subscribe, comment, follow. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. But hey, that's just theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.